Hi, this is an introduction to philosophy that explores some of the ultimate questions that philosophers pose and struggle with. My name is Mark Thoresby, and today we're really looking at this question, what is truth, in the context of uh, looking at the distinction Plato makes between being versus becoming Plato's theory of the forms. So really what I wanted to do, what I want to do in today's lecture is um, give you a primer on what Plato's basic philosophical theory is um, and, and maybe isolate for you exactly how that theory relates to the concept of truth. So, um, so that's sort of what we're going to do today and I'm going to sort of run in this order. The first thing I want to do is sort of start off with a little thought experiment uh, that relates to the category of truth and ultimately raises some problems that I think Plato is out to solve. And then the second thing I want to do is go over sort of my um, summary or my way of explaining Plato's theory of the forms, which I think will help you understand what's happening in the reading. And so the third thing we're going to do is actually take a look at the reading from the Republic that we're looking at. And we're looking at books, um, uh, let's see here, uh, six and seven are the books we're looking at. Sorry about that. So that's what, was, that's what I want to do in this lecture. So uh, welcome aboard, guys. Let's go ahead and get started. So first off, I want to make a couple of remarks about truth, right? And just begin by asking this sort of question, what is truth exactly? When we say that something is true, what exactly is it that we mean? Um, it's, uh, it seems fairly certain that what most of us mean is that when we say something is true, we mean to identify a specific statement or utterance that we think actually tells us something about the world. What I want you to see here is that whenever we talk about truth, we're all talking really about two different things. On the one hand, we're concerned with the epistemological conditions uh, necessary to determine whether or not something is true. I'll just put the epistemology. And if you'll recall, epistemology refers to a theory of knowledge. Um, so that is, when I ask this, for instance, when we say something's true, you could ask, well, how do you know it's true, right? The question of how is sort of the key term there, right? Epistemology, when we're talking about what, whether or not something's true, we need to know how it is we can know that anything is true. And on the other hand, when we say something is true, we're also talking about, we're also uh, engaging into a metaphysical discussion. Um, now, some philosophers will disagree probably here and maybe debate me on this. But when I say metaphysical, all I mean to say is that when we say that something's true, we're saying that something really does happen in the world. That is, we reference something about reality. Um, and we talked about metaphysics as being the analysis of reality, if you will. Um, and so that means there's sort of these two kinds, right? Or in other words, this is the what part of the question. So when we talk about truth, if we ask what is true, we're concerned with well, what's really the case in the world. And on the other hand, when we talk about truth, we can say, well, how do we know it's true? And there, there's, that's, a, that's a question about the epistemological conditions. So we're going to see that Plato, though, recognizes this. And he his theory of the forms actually ties all of this together in a very, actually, I think, very uh, sort of beautiful way and um, definitely brilliant. Uh, so that's so. I want you to keep in mind that that's sort of those are that's those are some of the things that are going to be necessary in this discussion of truth. Okay, uh, so let me go through a little thought experiment with you now. Um, and some of you, especially if you're new to philosophy, may not be familiar with this term. But what exactly is a thought experiment? Well, a thought experiment is when we set down a sort of narrative, a sort of situation of some sort. Um, that's very different from our own. And what we want to do is we want to tease out or deduce, maybe even, um, some of the consequences of that scenario that we're thinking about and then see if, the, if our thinking is analogous to real life. So let me just jump into the experiment here. It's, um, it's not scientific per se, but it is intellectually intriguing. So the first thing I want to start with here is this as a thought experiment that begins actually um, like from the 19th century. This is a very old thought experiment. A mathematician in the 19th century came up with this uh, discussion. And, and it's this idea. Imagine there's a planet, right? 
uh, a planet, and, but the planet is a gaseous planet, right? And at the very center of the planet, right, is where the people live. This is the rock, if you will. And now all the rest of this is just compressed gas. Now, we're going to ignore all of the probably important physical laws that would have to come into play here. And let's just imagine that on this gaseous planet, there are people at the very center here, and we can call them the geometers. Uh, I'm on the wrong thing. The geometers, right? They practice geometry, right? And they live in this planet. Now, the geometers are exploring their planet, and they want to know how big the planet is, right? They want to know the size of the planet. They want to know how big exactly is the planet, its circumference, if you will. Uh, but they they don't know how to figure out. They don't have space travel. They can't fly outside of their planet. So they're trying to figure out what would be the best way. Now, but there's one really important factor uh, about this gaseous planet, and that's that the further out you go on the planet, the colder it is. So it's the colder it gets, right? So it's colder out here, and it's warmer in the middle here. Um, and so remember here that when things get cold, what happens is the molecules compress, right? So you should know this, for, for, for instance, if you have a... Um, well, when I was a kid, we had a wood stove, right? And when the wood stove was cold and you start a fire, as it would warm up, you'd hear it crackling, right? And the same thing when it would compress. And so the idea here is that this planet is warm in the center, but that the further you go out, the colder it becomes until you reach, until if you even reach the, the very tip of the planet, out here, this is absolute zero. Um, absolute zero. And what absolute zero means, if you're not familiar with physics, is that it means that there's absolutely no molecular movement, right? Because we know that, that even though, for instance, this cup is solid, it's made up of molecules and atoms, which are slowly moving, right? But they are moving very slow, but they are moving. Absolute zero would be where they couldn't move at all. And so the idea here that gets postulated is that um, the further out you go in the planet, the colder and colder it gets, which means the more compressed things become. Now, this will become important because the geoners want to figure out how big their planet is, and so they devise a very innovative strategy, I guess, and that is they're going to build a ladder. They're going to build a ladder all the way up to the top. And what they want to see is they figure, well, they'll just keep building the ladder, and climb up, and eventually uh, they'll reach the outside, the outer edges of the planet, right? Uh, but what they don't realize is that they don't know that the planet gets colder and colder because it's a huge gaseous planet, and so the change in temperature is incremental. Now, but here's what happens with the geometers: that as they build the sections, right, they they start hoisting up the sections, on and on they go. But because the planet is is constructed this way or is exists this way what it means is that the further up they go the smaller the ladder is becoming and so as a result the more and more they put the more and more sections they hoist up the ladder the smaller they're becoming but the thing is is that they are themselves becoming smaller as they go up so they don't recognize that the the things are getting smaller um, and so they just keep adding section after section, but over time, the sections are smaller and smaller and smaller, and so at some point, they just give up. And they conclude, well, how big is the planet? Well, they say, our planet must actually be just infinite in size. That's a bad infinite symbol. It's kind of crooked here. Let me try it again, All right? All right, there we go. That's a little bit better. Um, so they conclude that their planet is infinite in size. Um, and the reason they've concluded that is because uh, because they it seems like they can put an infinite number of ladders um, they can put an infinite number of ladder sections up and it just doesn't matter they can never reach the end so they conclude based upon not only their uh, uh, experience but also their reasoning, right? They reason that the planet is infinite and they conclude this. Now, that means they have both mental as well as experiential facts to support this. But here's the thing, is that this is not, whoops, that this idea that the planet is infinite is not true. That's not actually the case. But there's no way for them to get outside of the planet because of the compression uh, towards absolute zero, there's no way for them to get outside of the planet to, to verify that their findings are right or wrong. And so as a result, they believe something is true when in fact it is false. 
right? And so the reason this is an interesting scenario is because it raises a question for us. Uh, what things do we believe, uh, what beliefs do we hold as true, which are in fact, which are actually false? Right? And really, actually, we should take this question seriously, right? What beliefs do we hold as true, which are actually false, right? And we're going to see there's actually an important distinction here because the beliefs we hold that are not true are just opinions, right? Um, and so we can make a distinction here between opinion on the one hand and truth on the other hand. Now, what's interesting, though, and Plato actually talks about this, not so much in our reading we're reading today, but he does talk about it quite a bit, is that we can have both true opinions and false opinions, right? And one of the questions, though, that's interesting is, if an opinion is false, it's false because the world doesn't match up with the opinion, right? But an opinion that's true is an opinion that just seems is insufficiently provable or proven, um, but it does, in fact, match up with the world. And so there's an interesting question here. Well, what exactly is the difference between a true opinion and truth itself? Uh, and, we're, and in fact, we're going to see today that Plato's theory of forms has a way of actually dealing with that problem. Um, but this question is totally critical because this question actually has real relevance for all of us. We are living our lives with a whole series of opinions and worldviews about the way the world is and the way it should be. And some of those views are false and some of them are true. Uh, and the question is, well, how do we know what, what is right and what's wrong? Because couldn't we potentially be in a scenario like the geometers are, where they can't figure out, no matter how many sections of ladder they build, how big or how small their planet is, to the point that they actually believe something that's false. They have a false opinion. Okay, so this is sort of what we're after in terms of addressing today. And what I want to do now is I'm going to slide forward and give a synopsis for Plato's Theory of the Forms, a primer, if you will. And then from there, we'll talk about the reading. And then at the very end, I want to come back to this question uh, about what we believe and whether or not what we believe, uh, how can we verify it, if it's true or just some sort of an opinion, okay? And these are important questions, and I encourage you to pause the video and actually think about them. Okay, well, let's jump in here and let's talk, let's give a primer uh, for Plato's theory of the forms. Now, for those of you that don't know, um, Plato's theory of the forms here, this is generally what's known as his metaphysical and epistemological theory. Like I mentioned earlier, there's two sides to this question of truth, and we're going to see Plato's theory handles both sides. And then the video after this one is on Aristotle, and you're going to see that we're going to handle that question as well, right? But let's, in order to, because I think if you jumped into today's reading, you would be a little bit lost because the theory of the forms is explained in in the passage, but it's not exactly clear, partially because we're just reading an excerpt, but also because um, I think that I think it's difficult to grasp. So I'm gonna try my best here to give you an example, to give you a way of understanding that may be a little bit better to understand. Okay. So the theory of the forms. Well the first thing to talk about here in terms of the forms here is the the word here that Plato uses actually, of course he doesn't use the English term, he uses a Greek term here, and the Greek term here is eidos. It's actually where we get the term idea from, okay? But he's not thinking of it as an idea, he's actually thinking of the form, the shape of things, quite literally actually. So let me give you an example. Let's imagine that, for instance, there's lots of different things in the world, and we have knowledge about a lot of these different things in the world. For instance, um, most of us know what a chair is, or a table. Let's use a table as an example instead, right? So here's, a, here's an example of a table, right? No, it's a, it's a glass top, so you can see the, uh, right, it's a glass top. So you can, see the, you can see the other leg behind it there. Now, this is a table, right? Now, ask yourself, what exactly is a table? Remember in, our la in a couple of videos, Earlier, we talked about the question, what is blank, blank, blank? I think we were talking about Plato's Apology. 
And the idea there was that in philosophy, we are after what we call the essence of something. We want to know what's essential about something. So ask yourself, what's the essence of a table? Now keep in mind here that you go through your life and you recognize tables everywhere you go, right? You, um, you've got, you see tables that are square with four legs. You see tables that are round with four legs. You see tables that are round with one leg, right? You see even tables that protrude outside of walls that don't have any legs. You've got square tables. You've got rectangular tables. You've got octagon tables. And tables can be made of wood. They can be made of glass. They can be made of stone. And so on and so forth. There's almost a, what appears to be an infinite variety of tables. Now, obviously, the, there's not an infinite variety, but there is an extraordinary degree of variety. Now, but think about it for a moment. When you walk into a classroom, you walk into an office, and you see a table, you immediately know it's a table, right? Keep in mind here that, that when you see a table and you recognize it, it's a matter of knowledge. You know it's a table, right? You don't walk into a, a restaurant and they say, would this table work? And you don't say, well, I'm not sure if that is a table, right? You don't do that. You just sit down. So that means that somehow, if you know what a table is, then you must somehow have essence to, to what a table is. Because remember, whatever the essence is, it's what explains how all of these different tables are somehow the same thing. That is, they're all a table, right? So, so that's one thing to keep in mind here, is that this is another way of seeing what we call the problem of the one and the many, right? We have... Uh, many different, well, I'll just keep it right here. We have many different tables right here, right? There's a whole plurality of tables, but yet there's only one essence, right? So what explains the one and the many? Now, when we talked about the pre-Socratics in our earlier video, the, the pre-Socratics were interested in understanding what is the fundamental substrate, if you will, of all things, right? What's the one thing for all of the many? Here we have a slightly truncated question here with Plato, which is, well, what's the essence of, of tableness such that all of these different tables participate in this essence, right? There's another thing that's important here, another distinction that's worth making here, the distinction between essence and existence, right? The essence refers to what something is, right? Whereas the existence refers to that something is, right? So for instance, um, if we're talking about tables, right? If I point to this object, right? If I point to this thing and I say, what is it? And you say a table, right? That means that we're talking about the essence of things. But if I say, no, no, but what about this one? I'm referring to the specific table. In that case, I refer to the existence of a table. So this distinction between essence and existence is a very, very important distinction. And you're actually going to see it's going to come back um, at the very end of our, of our semester when we look at the question of existentialism. Because this distinction is quite pivotal. Now, the question, though, that the, these early philosophers like Plato asked, for instance, is say, well, which one's more important, the essence of something or the existence of something? Well, uh, his, he ultimately concluded that the essence was more important. Or what, to use a fancy term here, we say that the essence has priority, logical priority, uh, meaning that the essence is more fundamental than the existence. And why is that? Well, because you can destroy the existence of something, but you can't seemingly destroy the essence of something. So imagine, for instance, if um, I came to the, to the university and the, or the college at night, and I took all of the tables in the classrooms, I, in all of the buildings, in all the conference rooms, everywhere I could, I found all of the tables, I piled them up in the parking lot, and I burned them down. I destroyed their existence. Right? So that means that imagine if we're talking about table, a table, right? So that's what the thing we're talking about. Imagine if I could destroy the existence of all tables. Would people still know what tables are, though? Right? Would they still have access to the essence? And the answer is yes, right? Because in the morning, everyone would come and there would be no tables that exist. Um, at the school, and yet people would still know what tables are. Now, we can make it even more extreme. Imagine if I destroyed every table in existence, right? All tables are just annihilated. 
people would still know what tables are. They would still have the concept. And why is that? It's because tables, when we talk about the existence of tables, one of the things we discover is that, uh, let me see if I can erase that. Right? When we talk about the existence of tables, the thing we have to recognize is that the things that exist are always going out of existence, right? Just like in um, Heraclitus, things are coming into and out of existence. All the tables that exist, they're also at some point going to stop existing, right? These, all of these things that exist are in, a, in, a, in this problem of change. They're constant flux, as Heraclitus taught us. But the essence seems to be eternal, right? It seems to be the case that the essence doesn't change, right? And so that means that, that meant for Plato that the essence of things was ultimately what's philosophically relevant. Because the essence is eternal, meaning it can't be destroyed because it's immaterial. It's actually intellectual, right? Um, it's an idea, an eidos, if you will. And so the idea here is that uh, if we want to gain true knowledge, we have to have knowledge of the essence of things, not simply about the existence of things, right? In fact, Aristotle, even though I know this is like from Plato, Aristotle makes an interesting distinction here. He says, for instance, a science studies the essence of something, whereas an art is, he doesn't use this language exactly, but an art is more concerned with the existence of things. You learn from what you experience, whereas science is about getting to what's the eternal truth of something. And we're going to see here that for Plato, the essence is where the truth of where truth can be found. Existence, it's not that there, this is false, but existence is sort of a shadow world, right? This is, if we might say, incomplete truth, right? An incomplete truth. Now, imagine, for instance, if a person only had knowledge of the things, tables that exist, right? They literally only knew a table if they could experience it, it being an existing thing. They, that means that they could, for instance, live their lives and, and sit down at tables and stuff like that. But they would be unable to um, imagine different types of tables, for instance. And we're going to see that reveals a sort of incomplete notion here. There's sort of incomplete truth. Now, we're going to see this distinction gets related to the difference between being on the one hand and becoming on the other. So, but we're going to talk about that here in a moment. So, but I want to give you another example here because we're going to see that for Plato, the essence is always, like I said, it's an idea. The essence is not a material object, right? Whereas the existence is. But the material object always going in is always um, slowly going out of existence. It's going to be destroyed, whereas the essence isn't. Now, let me give you an even better example that Plato would have certainly loved. Now, let me just make a new, new table here. Right? An even better example. And that's the example of mathematics. Uh, and think about it. Most of us, well, hopefully all of us here, have done mathematics. Uh, let me make that a little bit smaller. Uh, well, okay, I guess I can. Let's take math as an example. What is a triangle, right? A, a triangle, we all, we all know, is a polygon with three um, closed sides, uh, three closed angles, um, that is on a two-dimensional plane. So that's what a triangle is. Now, just to give you an example, let me draw some triangles for you. Right, here's a triangle. Here's a right here, I'm sorry, an equilateral triangle. Here's a, I think it's called an isosceles, and so on and so forth. And I could draw all kinds of triangles. I can draw big ones. I can draw little ones. You can draw triangles, as many as you want, right? And in fact, imagine, what, how is it that you can recognize that all of these things are triangles, right? Well, first off, you can ask yourself, is it through my mind or through through my, my visual experience. Well, clearly you must see these things first through your visual experience, but if you look at them very closely, none of these are really actually triangles, are they? Because look here, this one's crooked. Some of them don't have complete closed sides, for instance. There's all sorts of problems. These are poor triangles. They're bad triangles. But let me ask, but let me ask you this. Take, for instance, the Pythagorean theorem. Right? The Pythagorean theorem is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 
right? That's the theorem. It's really quite simple, right? And this is going to be true for any uh, triangle, any uh, right angle triangle there is in the world, right? So let's draw one here, right? You all know this. Okay, so a squared plus b squared is going to be equal to c squared. And that's how you can calculate here the hypotenuse of a triangle, right? This isn't a math class, so I won't go over it. But I want you to recognize that when you know this theorem, the first question is, how do I come to knowledge of the theorem? Well, do I come to knowledge through looking at the pictures, right? Because ask yourself, remember we made this distinction between existence and essence. The, here, here's an example right here in front of you on your computer screen of an existing triangle. It's existing in your computer screen, right, or on your computer screen. It exists. Now, but does your knowledge through the Pythagorean theorem come by looking at an existing triangle? Well, no, because number one, the, all of the existing triangles are actually, probably actually incorrect. Right? No matter what triangle, even if I pull out a math book and pull up a, a microscope, I'm going to eventually discover there's a flaw in that triangle. That The idea here being that the triangles we experience with our eyes are always, are never, that is, the, the triangles we experience with our eyes, with our senses, are never going to actually be the exact thing as the essence of a triangle. But, but here's the contention. To understand the Pythagorean theorem, you have to understand the essence of a triangle, not the existing triangle you're looking at. That's how come when you take a math class, you're, you're, the geometer, for instance, can draw triangles, and they're not drawn perfectly, but they still serve the purpose of teaching the class. That's because, ultimately, what you're learning is you're learning the, the form of a triangle. You're learning... And when I say form, I don't just mean the physical shape. I mean the essence of a triangle. You're learning the eidos of the triangle, right? And that is immaterial. That only exists in your mind, right? And it exists in such a way that every triangle that's ever existed on Earth will eventually be destroyed. And yet, somehow, we the knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem persists, right? Think about that. The Pythagorean theorem is eternal, right? Eternal in the sense that it is going to be, it was true when Pythagoras was alive, it is true today, it will be true for your children, and it will be true in a thousand or even ten thousand years from now, right? If you have an e, uh, a right angle triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that is always going to be true. No, even if the sun goes supernova and everyone is killed and destroyed, humanity is wiped off uh, or wiped out. Of existence, the Pythagorean theorem is still true. Now think about it. That means that the, the Pythagorean theorem in some sense is eternal, right? Its essence persists. Now think about it like this. I could, who knows a triangle, a person, I'm sorry, who knows geometry, a person who knows the Pythagorean theorem, or a person who can spot a picture of a triangle, right? Ultimately, the person who understands the essence of a triangle is the person who understand who has the truth. And we're going to see this is what Plato is going to argue. He's going to argue that truth, right, is revealed by the essence of a thing. And the essence of a thing is nothing other than its eidos or its form, right? Now, um, and the form is known through the intellect. This is what Plato is going to argue. Right? And the form, by contrast, is what allows us to recognize the many. Right? That is, all of the different essences we're looking about, looking around. So I understand the idea intellectually of what a table is, and that's what allows me to recognize in reality, in physical reality, all of these different objects that we all agree are tables, even though they all look different. Right? So let me see if I can give you another example here, just to sort of drive the point home here, right? Uh, Plato's idea here is that, um, let's think about a person, a human being, right? A human being, humans, right? We all know what a human is, right? And we can go anywhere in the world, and if a, per a human being walks up to us, we'll be able to recognize them as a human being, right? Think about it. When people go 
to um, a far off distant country they've never been to. For instance, if they go to the Mongolian desert, right? And they just parachute in and they see a person walking up to them, a person they've never seen before, a person who looks different than them, who talks different than them, and so on and so forth who's totally different from them, they are still going to know, and there's the key term there, they're going to know that person is a human, and they're going to know that that's true, right? So the question becomes here, wait a second, how is that the case? If knowledge came simply through experience, through visual experience, then it's conceivable that I could, for instance, go to somewhere and someone walks up to me, someone who's so different that I wouldn't know that they were human and I wouldn't be able to recognize them as human. And yet, I do know they're human. Which means that, what does it mean from Plato's perspective? He's going to argue that I must know what the form of a human is. We'll call it humanness. Right, humanness. And that the form allows me to understand the particulars. The particular existing entities, we'll put it. Or in other words, because I understand what humanness is, I can recognize uh, humans, human strangers. I can recognize human strangers because they're all different, right? And I can know what humans are even after humans die, right? So even if I, for instance, imagine um, all the humans I knew died which would be horrible, right? But if they all died, I would still know what a human is because I have access to this form. And this form here is going to be, you might, you might draw a line right here, right? And up here, this is, this is always intellectual. This occurs in the mind. It's intellectual. And this is where we, where we understand there's physical. And so what Plato's going to ultimately argue here is that every... Um, Every object that exists in the world has an essence and an existence. The essence is known through the form, and the existence is known through, uh, well, just the sense of the actual physical object, right? So let's go here and let's start over here. So what Plato ultimately gives us in his theory of the forms is he wants to say that we have to make this distinction between being on the one hand and becoming on the other. Being refers to what is, that is, things that don't change. Because remember, when something exists, if we go back to Parmenides, when something exists, it can't change, right? Which means that what we're talking about in terms of being are things that are eternal, things that don't change. And we know that everything that's physical changes. So being must be intellectual for Plato. Now, becoming describes things that actually are things that are in the world right and everything that's existing in the world is only temporary right including us we're going to die right including this the country the united states of america will eventually go out of existence in fact the planet itself will eventually be destroyed right so things so so our sense experience is down here we ex experience things that are in the world, and this is all temporary, and this is known through sensation. Right? Now, but here's the puzzle that the theory of the forms is going to allow us to uncover. Right? So let's put it down here. Uh, in the realm of becoming, we have the many. This is where we have all the different tables. In the realm of becoming, we have the one. That is, we have the form. Right? This is the form, the idos. And his argument is going to be that the form is what's true, and this is where knowledge is gained, but that all of these many different objects, right, that have this form must in some sense participate in the form. That is, somehow we recognize the form of tableness in this particular object, or, or somehow I recognize the form of humanness in you, in your physical body. Now, all of us is, are imperfect. None of us is the perfect form, right? Um, think about it like this. If we talked about, if we go back to our example of humans, right? Um, his, 
uh, Plato's idea here is that there's a form of humanness that is known purely through the intellect, that's gained through the dialectic. We can just put, um, we'll put the form is gained by the dialect. And remember, the dialectic there refers to the so Socrates and the Socratic method, right? That's all I'm talking about there. So, and then we, and then in the real world, we have all these different humans. So, let me give you an example here. We've got, we've got regular humans, the tall humans. We've got short humans, right? We've got fat humans, right? We've got humans um, who with only one arm, and so on and so forth. We've got humans who can't walk for it, right? Who are immobile, right? Or they're paralyzed, for instance. So we've got all different types of humans here. And yet somehow we all know that all of them are human, right? All of these people are human. Which means that all of them in some sense must have some gradation, some version of the form of humanness literally contained within their physical being, right? And I recognize that eternal form within their physical temporary body, and that's how I know they're human, but it's also simultaneously how I know they are a specific existing human being, right? So Plato's theory of the forms is that the philosophy is about trying to understand what the human itself is, so that we can understand the particulars down below, right? Now, I hope that makes some sense, and, and I know this is some, this is a difficult theory to understand, but I'm hoping it'll make sense here for you as we keep going, right? Because think about it, uh, if I had only known humans were this, right? If my, if my knowledge of humans came only from inspecting one human, then how would I know that this person's not, it, not some other animal? The reason is because somehow they all participate. They have enough features that are the same. And Plato thinks that, that those features must all participate in this eternal form of humanness. Because that also would explain why when all of these people die, right? Because this person's going to die, this person's going to die, this person's going to die. All of these people are going to die. They're at some point going to cease to exist. And yet the form of humanness will still exist. I'll still know what a human is. For when the new people are born, right? When the new, when the children grow up and be, well, I guess children are human too. So, when new people are born, I'll still recognize them, even though all of these humans I've known are dead, right? That's why, for instance, I don't know, like I didn't exist in the 12th century, for instance, and yet I know that all that there were human beings in the 12th century. How is it that I can know that? Well, it's because I have artifacts that can only be explained with creatures who have the essence of humanness to explain how those things are possible. Now, what is the essence of humanness? Plato actually sort of gets into this. He's going to see the principal feature is rationality. But I'll talk about this in just a moment. So this is sort of a general gist of what Plato's talking about in the theory of the forms. Now, let me draw your attention to the reading and so that maybe I can explain what's going on in, one of, in the very first passage, in the very first part of the reading. Now, this is from 494E of the Republic in Book 6. Now, this is where I wanted you to start reading, but take a look what, what uh, Plato says. Or, or actually, Socrates is the person speaking here. Keeping all this in mind, recall the following question. Can the majority in any way tolerate or accept the reality of the beautiful itself? as opposed to the many beautiful things or the reality of each thing itself, as, a, as opposed to the corresponding many. Now, I want, don't worry about what the question he's talking about here is can, or about the majority and whether or not the majority can tolerate it. Because this first section is where he just sort of goes, he discusses why people hate philosophy, right? <laughs> why philosophy is not exactly a popular subject, uh, but why ultimately it's a critical subject, right? But the reason I want to draw your attention is because he talks about the beauty itself as opposed to many beautiful things. In order to understand what he means here, we'd have to draw a statement like this, right? Is that in our that we have an idea of beauty, right? Something beautiful, but we have all these different things in the world that we all think are beautiful, right? Everything from a beautiful sunset, right, to a, a, a beautiful art piece. Right? To a beautiful person, right? someone who has a model or something. To, for instance, 
a beautiful chess game or something like that. So you can imagine you have a sunset over here, right? You have a sun, I forgot what they all were here, but that's all right. You have a sunset, for instance. Um, you have art, a piece of art that's beautiful. You have a person who you think is beautiful. And then, for instance, you can have a, a, a game, a chess game that's beautiful. I know it's hard to believe, but some chess players do refer to chess games as beautiful things, right? So the question is, you have all of these different things that are beautiful, uh, but this is what he means when he talks about beauty itself, right? He's talking about the eidos, or the form of beauty. And what he ultimately thinks is that philosophy is trying to uncover this what beauty itself is, right? And he thinks that most people live their lives down here in the, in the becoming world where they talk about, they can talk about, they can recognize one thing is beautiful, but when you ask them what beauty itself is, it's like they hit a, hit a brick wall, right? Think about it, for instance. In, in fact, I should say, I'll maybe move here and talk a little bit about the Republic in general. Let me move down here, right? The central question of the Republic is what is justice, right? And can we live just lives? That's what actually the entire Republic is about for Plato. It's about uncovering this question of what justice is. And it's not until this chapter, because up to this point, what we get a lot of is we get discussions of people saying, well, this is just, this is just. We get a lot of examples of what just looks like in its particularity, but we don't know what justice itself is. And that's what's ultimately at stake. Not until this passage when he begins to talk about, not just in particular, but the forms. Justice, to understand what justice is, justice is a form. An intellectual form, right? That somehow, there are sort of things that exist in the world that participate in that form. But the form is what's critical, okay? So that's a sort of primer of what the theory of the forms is about. Now, what's happening in this particular passage? There's a number of different things that are happening. Um, and I can't talk about all of them as much as I would love to. Um, and I encourage you in the discussion boards to, or in the comments to bring this up and raise some questions here. But one of the things we recognize is that in the Republic, he wants to know what... Um, what justice is, and there's sort of two key passages that I want to mention in this one. The first one is what's known as the divided line. The divided line. And then the second thing we'll talk about here is the allegory of the cave. Okay, so let me pull up the divided line here for you. Uh, well, actually, no, let me pull it up in the reading. Uh, so you can see where it is in, in the text. Okay, here you go. Oops, let me move this here. So you can see here, let's begin here with Socrates, right? Socrates says, therefore, you should always say that not only do the objects of knowledge owe their being, their being known to the good, but their being is also due to it. Oh, I've, I've skipped ahead too far, haven't I? Sorry about that. Um, let's see here. Oh, here we are. Here's the passage. My apologies, right? Um, he, there's this great passage from truth, and then I'll show you the divide line in a little bit more of its particularity. But read with me. He says, so that, what, so that what gives truth to the things known and the power to, the, to know to the knower is the form of the good, and though it is the cause of knowledge and truth, it is also an object of knowledge, both knowledge and truth are beautiful things, but the good is other and more beautiful than they. In the visible realm, light and sight are rightly considered sunlight, but it's wrong to think that they're like the sun. So here it's right to think of knowledge and truth as good-like, but wrong to think that either of them is the good, for the good is yet more prized. So what I want you to do is see that this passage is critical, but in order to fully understand it, let me go over here and show you what's known as the divided line. Okay. So hopefully, let me see if I can make that a little bit bigger for you guys. Okay, whoop, that's too big. Okay, sorry, the, um, my thing here is. Um, one sec. Okay, so here's what's known as the divided line, okay? Socrates says, cause now this is the sort of 
there's we're talking on two things here about you can see knowledge versus opinion but we're also talking about um, epistemology and metaphysics right so what plato says or socrates in the republic says let's imagine there's a line and let's divide it in half right so here's the line we've divided in half on one side is becoming right and on the other side is being right so and this is why an opinion corresponds with becoming and knowledge corresponds with being and here he's talking about the development of knowledge, right? So you might say that when we gain knowledge, let me see if I can write on this. Let me see, one second. Okay, there we go. I'm going to see if I can draw on this for you because I, I love to draw on things. Um, okay, here we go. So the thing here is that knowledge is, begins here and moves this way, right? And over here, this is being. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not right. Over here is becoming, I meant to rather to say, right? This is becoming, and this is being over here. And what he wants to say is that when we're born in the world, we're born into a world of becoming, right? Everything is constantly changing. Think about Heraclitus here. In fact, you can imagine that this side is Heraclitus and this side is Parmenides, and really what Socrates, not what Plato's doing is synthesizing the, these great insights from these great thinkers, actually going all the way back since Pythagoras. Okay, but when we're born into the world, well, what can we do, right? We're born into a world that everything's changing, and knowledge begins purely through the imaging, right? Through perception, right? I literally see things, and I gain sort of knowledge about them, right? Think about a child, for instance, looks out the window and sees a bird for the first time. It sees the bird. Now the question is, when, when the child sees the bird, is it enough to say that the child understands what the bird is simply through seeing it? The answer is no. Perception is insufficient, Plato thinks, right? And he thinks that many people actually may even live their whole lives here, probably not most. Because the things what happens is over time, we have these perceptions and these perceptions accumulate into beliefs, right? They accumulate into these beliefs. And he used a different term here, pistis or common sense. And he thinks that what essentially is we, we develop, if you will, a belief in a reality, in the reality of the visible objects. And we slowly develop these beliefs and these beliefs are not wrong. But the problem is these be beliefs are still based on becoming. Um, or in the realm of becoming, and the only thing you have access to in becoming are particulars, right? The many, as it was referred to in the passage. The many things that are beautiful. So, but for Plato, this is all opinion. This is what opinion is. Opinion is, is when, our, when we have ideas, but our ideas are based essentially on our perception and the accumulation of perceptions we've developed over time, that we call those beliefs. But that's not knowledge for him. Knowledge begins when we move beyond the physical, because remember, uh, this whole realm is physical, and over here, this is all intellectual. And remember, the intellectual is eternal, right? And he thinks that we transition when we move into dionia, uh, dionia right? Or that's thinking, it's using reasoning from premises to conclusions. And he says, for instance, we develop empirical science, we, we have these hypotheses and we try to reason using those hypotheses. Remember here, what convinces a scientist is not the experimental data he watches with his eyes. What convinces a scientist is what she reasons with her mind about the experimental data. So he thinks that this is when we get into understanding, right? And this is knowledge, but this occurs in the mind. And then of course, mathematics, applied mathematics, and ultimately pure mathematics, right? But ultimately, knowledge is moving in this direction. Knowledge really accumulates, or intelligence, if you will, with the dialectic. And the dialectic gets us to the forms, right? To the idos. And it gives us knowledge, or episteme. That's where we get that term epistemology from. And this is through, dialectic is through a process of deduction, ultimately, right? And think, the term he uses is eidos here, but it goes back to this logos, an account, right? And his idea here is that all of the different ideas we have for humans, triangles, cups, um, justice, virtue, right? Goodness, uh, and so on and so forth, all of these things have forms, and then 
as we're gaining knowledge, and this comes through philosophy, that's the dialectic again, that we're slowly gaining knowledge of them, but at the very top is the form of what he calls the form of the good. And that's what he was talking, that's what uh, Socrates was talking about in this passage when he says, uh, uh, both knowledge, uh, knowledge and truth and beautiful things, but the good is other and more beautiful than they. Now, what's the idea here? Let me move here to a different thing. Imagine, for instance, so we have this divided line. We're moving, right, in from opinion over here into knowledge. But our knowledge acute, our our knowledge um, culminates in with um, knowledge of the form. So once we know what a form is, that is, once we know the essence of something, we know it is true. We know it is. We know it as true. It is true because the form is what's true, right? The opinion can never be true, and the realm of becoming can never be truth, because truth is something that doesn't change. And everything in the realm of becoming, and thereby opinion, is always in flux, is changing. So the forms don't change. But the thing is, the forms are actually organized um, hierarchically. Some forms are greater than others, right? Think about the idea that, for instance, uh, well, let me just say this. The top form is the form of the good, right? Uh, that is, all of the other forms participate in the form of the good. That it, Why would Plato say that? Because as we gain knowledge of any form, whether that form be the form of triangles or it be the form of justice, all knowledge itself is always good. It's better to know what the truth is than not, which means that all of the forms must have... Um, an element of the good within them, which means that the good must be the primary form. And so that's what he recognizes as the principle, the highest of all the forms. And that's because all of the other forms participate in it in the same way that all of the objects participate in the forms, right? So he creates this hierarchical system, right? And he does it because he doesn't know how else to explain how it is we do have knowledge of things and why that knowledge would be good or bad, okay? Uh, so we end up with this sort of, this is what's known as the divided line. And the divided line, right, on the one hand, it, it tells us about the epistemology of Plato, right, when we get this distinction between knowledge and opinion, but it also tells us about the metaphysics of Plato, being versus becoming, right? And that's because um, ultimately, opinion is based upon our our physical experience of things changing, whereas knowledge um, is an activity of the mind through the dialect, whereby we gain access to what truly is. Is in the sense of mathematics. Remember we talked about mathematics. Mathematics doesn't change, so too is the case here. Now, Plato um, actually, whoops here, Plato actually discusses this story in what's known as the allegory of the cave, or that rather... He embodies the divided line in the allegory of the cave. And the allegory of the cave is sort of a story. It's a narrative to help us remember. And it, and it begins in this sort of picture here. Uh, and it's also a story about us, really, I think. right? Now, imagine, for instance, there's, these, there's people who are born into the world chained, literally chained to their chairs, and all they can do is just look straight out at a wall, right? You can't tell, but these people are facing a wall that's right here, right? They're facing a wall in a cave. Now, behind them is a fire, right? And there's this sort of roadway, if you will, and there, there's a sort of puppet master here who, who puts an object here, right? And the fire creates a shadow on the wall, right? Now, right, you can imagine it creates a sort of shadow like that. But these people are chained and they can only pay face in one direction. And so all they can see are the shadows on the wall. Now, imagine if you were actually born into a world like this where you're chained and all you could see was just shadows, right? And, and you can imagine that you would think that the thing you're looking at truly is the object. You can imagine these prisoners down here, they have names for these shadows. They call some shadow a dog's. They call other shadows butterflies, and still others they call um, cats, and so on and so forth. So they have names for the shadows, but because they've never seen anything but the shadow, they're likely to believe that the shadow itself is actually what the word dog means, right? So for instance, if you say, what is a dog? They're going to point that thing right there, that shadow, right? 
And what Plato was also arguing in this allegory is that this is really where we are. This is where we are before we start doing philosophy. We're looking at shadows. We're looking at our experiences, our physical experiences, and thinking we have knowledge when really we don't. And so he says, imagine one of these slaves suddenly, for, or prisoners rather, suddenly becomes free and stands up for the first time, right? Uh, now imagine that they turn around for the first time and behold the fire. What would that experience be like? Well, you, you can imagine it would be blindingly bright. And would they understand what they're seeing? The answer is, of course, no. If they've never seen a fire before, then they'll be very confused and not know how to explain what they're looking at. But let me ask you this. And let's imagine they look and for the first time they actually see this shadow puppet. And they see the shadow puppet and now they recognize, after they acclimate, that this thing is actually causing this thing up here. Now, which one's more real, this object or this object? The object what causes it or the effect? Well, the cause is more important. It's more essential, right? And so they may even believe that, wow, they would realize that the thing they called the dog before was actually this thing and that they were wrong, right? Um, and so you can imagine this is Plato is saying, this is what it's like when we first start doing philosophy, right? So, for instance, when we first start doing these dialectical exercises and asking these questions like, what is truth? What is reality? These questions are very difficult for us, not because there's not an answer, or because there's no point in asking them, but because we are like these prisoners standing up for the first time and looking out and being blinded by what we've never beheld before, but what is more real, right? You can imagine that this stage in the divide, this stage corresponds to the first stage in the divided line, the stage of imaging, right? Imaging. That's what we get over here. But this stage where the prisoner recognizes this, this seems to correspond to the second stage, the stage of belief, right? So we might say that this is perception and this is belief. Now, then Plato says, well, what would happen if this prisoner, for the first time, takes the road out to, to go outside for the first time and goes outside, let's say, imagine they go outside for the first time and it's bright, right? They're, they're standing outside now, right? Let's say this is what it looks like, right? It's bright outside. What would that feel like? Well, again, they would be blinded. And here you can imagine what Plato's suggestion is, this is part of the reason it's difficult to understand the philosophers, because it's difficult for philosophers to articulate that which they've never seen before, right? And this, when they first walk outside, this corresponds to this first stage uh, in the divided line here of thinking, right? And he says, let, and, and Plato doesn't say this in there, but imagine, for instance, this person sees a dog. They actually see a real dog, right? They would recognize for the first time that the thing that they were calling dog uh, here wasn't real, that not even was the puppet real, but that the puppet was actually an imitation of this thing, the real object, or if you will, the form of dogness. That these are just bad imitations. They're just, uh, if you will, things that participate in the actual form of the dog. So finally, this person for the first time is actually gaining access to real knowledge. Now, but he uses this analogy of light, and the only way you'd be blinded by the light, and he imagines you'd be even more blinded if you saw the reflection of the light in a pool. But imagine if you looked up at the sun directly. In that case, you can't even see anything. You're completely blinded. And the sun, for Plato, right, oops, I'm sorry. The sun corresponds to the good, right? It corresponds to the good. And so Plato's idea here is that with when we come to knowledge of the forms, we gain truth, but that truth participates in the good. So there's a sort of ethical story here too. All knowledge for Plato is good. That's why philosophers should, and we all actually should seek knowledge, even if right that knowledge isn't useful per se. And in fact, there's a great passage in the Republic here where Plato he says, he says, people say all the philosophers are doing useless stuff. Why well, do philosophy if it's not useful? And his answer is quite very much, this is his answer, I should say, rather, right? Is that you gain knowledge of truth, 
which actually makes you a better person and you live a better life, in fact, and you have a better society and so forth, right? So he has this idea and then he says, of course, he suggests this, well, what would happen if the prisoner, you know, went back down, for instance, to the, to the, to the original prisoners and tried to free these guys, tried to uh, loosen their bonds. What does Sartre, Sartre says, what do you think would happen? And he says, these people would probably be very upset by that. And they may lay hands on the original prisoner and kill him. And of course, Plato's giving us a reference to Socrates. Because he sees Socrates as this. Socrates looked like sort of a buffoon and a fool. Not because he was a buffoon or a fool, but because he was out here, if you will. right? He was on his way out of the cave, blinded by the forms blinded by the em the emanation of the goodness through knowledge that Plato postulates, and thereby he couldn't explain it. He couldn't talk well. He couldn't explain himself. He sort of trips over himself and looks like an idiot, but actually he's wiser than the rest. And of course, when Socrates comes down with the very mission of freeing the Athenians, they do nothing other than execute him, right? And that's because there's also this story here is that many of us, Right, while many of us are addicted to our our chains, to our bonds, right? Many of us do not want to give up on the illusions that we believe are true and actually believe what really is what really is truth. Right? Where most of us are willing to kill for certain uh, beliefs um, if they challenge us to to, to certain extents. And think about that, right? That goes back to our original question, which is what beliefs do we have that we think are true that may be false? Now, how do we come to knowledge about whether or not they're true or false? Plato's answer is quite simple. It's through the dialectic, right? It's through the dialect. It's through this deduction through interlocution. That's how he thinks knowledge is gained. Now, we're going to see that, his, that in our next video that Aristotle agrees but slightly disagrees with him as well. Now, I know I didn't get a chance to really go through the nitty-gritty details of the of the passage we we're reading today, and that's too bad because it's such a good passage. Um, and, and I'll probably try to reference it, but please, I'm hoping you can watch this video and then you can go back and read um, the passage um, and really gain a lot from it. So this video is meant to instruct you, to help you in terms of reading it, not to take the place of reading it. So please make sure to still read that passage. Um, but that's essentially... The discussion of Plato's conception of truth. And the critical thing is really just memorize this table, right? What is truth? Truth is things that can be known. Truth are the forms, or as we had it in the actual passage. So what gives truth to the things known is the form of the good, right? So he has this idea that knowledge, that truth is somehow bound up with goodness. And that the good, though, even though we talk about different things being good, the good itself is the highest of all the forms. And like the sun, it can't be easily encapsulated, though it should be meditated upon. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit of a primer between Plato's theory of the forms and being becoming, and how Plato seeks to understand this question of truth, of what can and cannot be true, and how we can come to know the truth, okay? I'm gonna conclude the video here. There's lots more I'd like to keep going, lots of notes I have, but we're already an hour in, so I'm gonna conclude here. Thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you guys online, okay? Bye.